Hello everybody, my name is Kai Wehner from Confluent. Today I want to talk to you about Apache Kafka versus traditional middleware like message queues, extract transform load tools or an enterprise service bus. And the key question I get every week at customers is, are they friends, enemies or frenemies? That's what I want to discuss with you in more detail today in this presentation. Please give your feedback afterwards if you agree, if you have questions or comments. And even if you want to criticize this or don't agree, please let me know. Here's the agenda for this session. First, I will talk a little bit about what I mean with traditional middleware. And then I compare it to an event streaming platform like Kafka. And then really the focus is to talk about are they enemies, friends, or can they also work together very well? That's what we will see in the session today. Apache Kafka versus traditional middleware is a discussion, as I said, I see it every week. On the funny side, um, we agree that Kafka is the de facto standard for things like messaging at scale, for processing millions of messages, often also for building a microservice architecture where you decouple the different producers and consumers from each other. And everybody knows that Kafka is a reliable, lightweight stream processing engine also. That's great, but the key question today is, is Apache Kafka the right tool for middleware, for building a modern integration layer? And how does this compare to the products you already have in your company, like an ESB or ETL tool? That's what I want to discuss today. So let's think about traditional middleware first. What is it? This is what you see when you buy a new product or download an open source tool for classical middleware. So you have different sources which you want to integrate via, via connector or maybe a standard like JMS. And then you integrate with the integration tool and then you use other connectors or maybe standards like REST or SOAP to send the data to some things. That's the theory, right? Um, in practice, actually, it looks a little bit different. So if you want to use an integration layer, then you typically have to use many different components here. So if you want to use any kind of enterprise service bus or ETL tool, and it doesn't really matter if it's proprietary stuff from a software vendor or if it's open source Apache projects or so, typically you see something like this. And think about that in your company, no matter which vendor you use. Do you have just one single product in the middle for your integration layer? Or do you maybe really have an integration framework in the middle? Then you also have a messaging system or maybe even more than one messaging system, one for real time and one for big data, or one for queues and one for peer to peer. And then um, of course you also need to process the data continuously. So you have a stream processing engine somewhere. You probably use some kind of database for stored data, or maybe also an in-memory data grid for cache data for processing and accessing it in real time. And then still maybe um, this is not enough. So you have another integration tool in your integration layer infrastructure. Right, so that's what I see at almost every customer I talk to. So you have to build your own custom integration layer. And even if you just work with one vendor, you have at least four to five different products. And as these integration layers typically have to run 24 seven with zero downtime in best case and have to scale well, this is really an issue because you have to do end-to-end -end integration with zero data loss and zero downtime. And then you have to deploy and combine and integrate four or five or even more different products and components all with their own storage layer or backup layer or something like this. So that's not ideal, but that's the real world in traditional middleware. And that's the key problem, what I want to focus on today. Because this has a lot of challenges if you want to use these kind of technologies for your integration layer. First, as I discussed, it's a zoo of technologies. You don't have just one product or infrastructure in the middle, you have several ones, which you have to develop, test, operate and upgrade. That's a huge problem already. However, there's much more. So typically, most of these components are not really scalable and available all the time. Depending on the product and components you use, you typically don't reach end-to-end -end scalability because not everything is built for high volume of messages or throughput. And also, you cannot typically simply just add another broker to the server system. It's often more like some kind of active-passive clustering where you have one active server and a passive server. And then you deploy hundreds of these instances, like with MQ clusters, right? So you don't have one bigger MQ cluster, you have many different small ones, all with two servers for active passive mode. 
And then often what you have in your integration layer is downtime for things like maintenance, upgrades, configuration changes, or simply failures in your system. So that a disk is down, a service down or so. And the other problem also is that you often have no backwards compatibility. So if you want to upgrade your technology, like your middleware, you often also have to upgrade the clients together with them, which is often impossible if you integrate many different systems. In addition to these limitations, on the other side with traditional middleware, you almost always have tight coupling between your systems. So think about that. How do you implement your integrations? You typically implement that with your middleware. Right? So you use your tool of your enterprise service bus and you build a new integration pipeline. So the core platform team has to develop this and deploy and maintain it. And if the business team or the client team has to some changes or requirements, you have to go to the middleware team again. So there is no real separation of concerns. And often it's not really loosely coupled because you use technologies like SOAP or REST. So you typically do some kind of RPC communication, request response. So everything has to be up all the time. There is also therefore no handling of back pressure in these cases. So you have, for example, maybe even if you have a messaging system in the middle, like a queue, if the queue is full, you have a problem. Or if the consumer is not available while the producer is still pushing and pushing, or if the consumer is not fast enough, it cannot consume as fast as the producer produces data. That's a lot of problem. And you see a lot of this in different middleware. However, the key problem with this today, so if you think about, okay, this worked in the last 20 years, at least for some scenarios, why do we need a change today? And the reason for this is that the world has changed and everybody knows this. You have things like mobile apps, cloud, flexible microservices, IoT integration from edge to on-premise to different clouds. And you have new technologies like machine learning, where you build analytic models to do predictions on all the big data and deploy that to real-time applications. So in the end, what you need today is a business digitalization trend that is driving the need to process events at all new scale, new speed and new efficiency. So that's three different core components and you have to solve them. And that's not possible with traditional middleware because of the reasons I just explained. So no matter which traditional middleware like messaging systems, enterprise service bus or ETL tool you use, it can handle this well because of the tight coupling, the limited scale and the slew of components. That's not really ready for this new kind of problems you have to solve in the new world with digitalization and innovative applications. So that's the reason in the end why I do this session today to talk about another option for this, which is the event streaming platform, where you really have to think event based to realize the new use cases in this world. And here you can leverage a single scalable and loosely coupled platform to do that. Therefore, after we've seen what a traditional middleware is, let's now think a little bit more about what an event streaming platform is and how it differs from a traditional middleware. So in the end, it's the same, right? So you have a thing in the middle and it connects to different sources and things. So, well, you would say, okay, this is just another one of these magic boxes in the middle. I've seen this for message queues, for ETL tools and for enterprise service bus in the last 20 years from all the different vendors and marketing slides, right? So what is different now, another box in the middle? Before I want to explain that in more detail, we have to understand the new basic concept. So it's not just the technology which is changing, but really the paradigm behind that. In the new world, you have to think about events to build scalable, reliable and efficient applications and infrastructures. So what is an event? An event in the end is if something happened. This can be anything, a sale, an invoice, a trade, a customer experience, or whatever you think about in your industry and in your business use cases. Where are the events? That's a good question because events are everywhere. So in this environment here, everything which happens here now could be an event. For example, this guy here, which does something. There's many, many different events in parallel going on here, totally loosely coupled and independent of each other. The problem here is that events hadn't had a proper home and infrastructure and code. They are really implicit. 
So if you think about that in your in integration layers and with traditional middleware, yeah, you store something in databases and you do a request response and get data from somewhere and send it somewhere and use a lot of connectors and so on. But in the end, um, there was no place for real event-based processing. So this is a new paradigm. You have to develop your applications in a different way and use new infrastructure for that under the hood. And that is where the event-based middleware comes into place. So instead of using traditional middleware, where you present data in static tables and access them often via request response, remote, remote procedure calls, and these kind of things, or even sometimes with a, with a queue, for example, for push-based messaging, with all these different components, instead, you need to represent the data as streams of events. And that's really what an event streaming platform means. You integrate with all the different systems, like with the ESP or ETL tool, but in an event-based way. And what's very important and what you can already see here, this does not mean that every application has to be event-based. We can still integrate with, for example, a relational database or with a data warehouse or with a mobile app via request response. So that's all possible. But the key difference is that the foundation, the middleware is event-based because then it's easy to implement other paradigms on top of that. But if the middle is on a database or is batch or request response, then you cannot build um, real-time systems around that easily or even based systems. So the next question you might ask now is, haven't we seen all this before already? And the answer again is yes, we did. So if you take a look at this, in 2009, so around 10 years ago, there was a book, Even Driven Architecture how service-oriented architectures enable the real-time enterprise. And even five years before that, in 2004, 15 years ago, there was a nice book talking about building the real-time enterprise. So this is not a new concept at all. And many vendors like TIPCO, Informatica, IBM, or even open source projects like RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ have implemented some kind of messaging. And you probably have one of these in your enterprise already and use it. So the key question now is what's different this time with an event-based streaming platform? The key difference really is that the underpinning of this foundation is an event-based infrastructure and technology. I will talk about the technology differences in a minute, but here really the key is that the core foundation is completely different because it's not just a messaging queue in the middle or some kind of integration pipeline which you have here between the systems. That's what already exists for 20 years, right? It's really a native event-based infrastructure which runs 24-7 with zero downtime and zero data loss. It's one single platform for that. And that's the key difference to all the traditional middleware. And we will now take a look at more technology discussion, how this is different. And with these kind of concepts, traditional middleware versus even streaming platform, let's now take a look at the details. First of all, um, these two components or concepts are enemies, right? And yes, absolutely. Because in the end, all of them want to be the integration layer in the middle, which integrate all your different systems. You have the middleware, which might be a message queue or an ETL tool for batch processing or an enterprise service bus for request response or messaging. And then you have the event streaming platform. And here you have typically Apache Kafka. So the first difference here you see is that for traditional middleware, you have plenty of different components and products. Typically the big software vendors have not just one middleware product, but 10 or more of them. For an event streaming platform, if you Google for any kind of company on this planet, you typically will find out that they will use Apache Kafka as de facto standard for event streaming platforms. But still you have a spoil for choice. So why should I even use things like Apache Kafka instead of my existing middleware, which I already have paid for and have infrastructure for? Again, remember the world has changed. So um, you have to do things differently for different reasons, like building applications at new scale or at new speed. Or maybe, maybe if you don't have 
new big data projects, but still talk about existing applications and existing use cases like payments or fraud detections with maybe only 100 transactions per second. Then maybe the difference is the efficiency. So you have to be agile in development and in deployment. So you want to build new applications like microservices to try out new things, maybe even fail with them and throw them away and try them in another way or do things like A-B testing and so on. All that stuff um, is a world changer. So you have to do it differently today. And that's what's not possible with the traditional middleware and its infrastructure and technologies and IDEs and toolings. And therefore, let's think a little bit more about what is the event streaming paradigm. The key difference to traditional integration components is that the middle is really an event log. This means you store every single event in this log. So the producer produces new information as single event, and this is stored in the log, event by event by event, in an immutable way. And then it is stored there. That's a key difference to a queuing system, for example. It's not just pushed there and pushed out. It's stored there as long as you want, for seven days, for 30 days, for a year, or even forever. And then the different consumers can consume it whenever they want, how fast they want. One could be real time, another one could be batch. And also how often you want. Let's think about model training for in machine learning, for example. You can consume the data again and again to train different models. Or if you add a new application later, let's say consumer C, then it can start from the beginning or from a specific timestamp and consume all the data in an event-based way. So it's not just a database, it's really all is event-based. And that's the core difference to all the traditional middleware systems with messaging or storage or databases. And this event streaming platform is not just used for sending data from A to B. That's very important to understand. It's really also meant to integrate with all the other systems. So it's also the integration layer to integrate either to standard applications or to custom applications. And also the next important thing is also to process the data, either for integration, like extract, transform, load in real time, filtering, aggregations, transformations, but also for building new applications in a streaming way, like real-time fraud, real-time 360 customer analysis, real-time inventory, and all these different examples. Many of these business cases are the same as 10 or 20 years ago, but now you build them in a new way, in an event-based way that you can correlate and process the events in real time or as fast as you want without thinking too much about databases or batch or any other technologies in the background. It's a single event streaming platform in the middle. And with that, we now come to Apache Kafka because that's, as I said before, the de facto standard for real time event streaming. This is the framework everybody uses. It's an Apache framework, open source and Apache license. You can do with that what you want. You can change it. You can run in production at scale as much as you want. And it's just open. It's for global scale, real-time processing. And however, very important to understand, Kafka is not just a messaging layer like some people think. It's also a storage layer. So Kafka also stores the data as long as you want. And it's also a stream processing engine. So you can also process the data with Kafka without any additional tools or components. Here are just a few examples. Kafka is really battle tested already. It's almost 10 years old now. And companies like LinkedIn process over 4 to 5 trillion messages per day with Kafka. Or Netflix, for example, processes over 6 petabyte of data per day. And this is really just a few examples. You can Google for any kind of tech company from Silicon Valley and you will find how they use Kafka at scale for their 24 seven deployments. However, this is just the one part. So Kafka is not just for tech giants and it's also not just for big data projects. That's very important to understand. Let's take a look at a few different examples of customers we build uh, streaming applications with Kafka and Confluent platform with. So um, it's either really building about core business platforms like you build in Blue. And it's not just about the tech companies. It's really also the banks, the insurance companies, the telcos, which build their core business platforms around Kafka. And that's often not big data. That's often smaller data like for bank transactions. So it's not always millions of messages per second like for clickstream analysis. Sometimes it's just a few messages, but they have to be critical and zero data loss up 24 seven and really exactly one semantics for end to end processing. On the other side, in addition to building new applications, 
Sometimes it's more about decreasing cost. So you want to increase the operational efficiency or maybe um, replace some middleware or really do some microservice architecture just for agile and flexible and efficient development and deployment of new innovative services. And the third kind of use case is, is to mitigate risk. So for example, for fraud detection or we see it more and more for regulatory uh, use cases. Here, the streaming platform enables you to do things like you could not do it before. In real time, at scale, in a reliable way, loosely coupled from each other. So here I just wanted to show you, with, this is not really like traditional middleware, just an integration layer, you can do much, much more with it. But still, the core foundation often is the integration layer around the Kafka streaming platform. So now let's take a little bit more detail about the reasons why so many people use Kafka instead of traditional middleware. As I said before, this is big changes ahead and this is a good thing. Um, it's really a different foundation because it's event-based and with that um, you also have many advantages of an event streaming platform. The core is event-based, as I said, so you can build batch and request response around that, but not the other way around and therefore the core central nervous system has to be event-based. And therefore it supports real-time stream processing, but you also can do a long-term processing or batch. And it can also do other paradigms like fire and forget for log analytics, for example. Right? So you have all the options, but the core central platform has to be even based to do all with one single platform. The next key component is its single infrastructure. Kafka itself is messaging, storage and processing. This is the most important message if you're new to Kafka to understand. It's one single infrastructure for doing all three of these, messaging, storage, and processing. And that's the core reason why you do not need five different components and products, but really it's one single infrastructure. And also it's built for extreme scale and throughput. So it's really built for millions of messages and megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, and petabytes of throughput. So you don't need different technologies for different kind of scale or throughput. You can start small with Kafka, even for small message sizes or throughput and scale it up later. Or build many different use cases on one Kafka cluster. The third important point is Kafka is reliable and it's built for failure. So it means zero downtime. That's the reason it's a distributed system. It's not just one of these legacy active passive architectures. It's a real distributed system where it's okay if a server is down, if a disk is broken, if the network is not working. It allows zero downtime even if brokers or infrastructures fail. And the same is true, for example, for maintenance. If you want to do things like rolling upgrades or dynamic configuration changes, you can do that without downtime. It's built for that. And also very important because with Kafka, you typically integrate with many different producers and consumers on both sides. It's backwards compatible. That means zero downtime even if you want to upgrade a version. And you can only upgrade just a client or just a server. Each of them is independent of each other. So they are in both sides backwards compatible regarding versioning. That's very important if you have to um, realize that infrastructure, especially for the integration layer in the middle with zero downtime. And another key component, and many people are also not aware of this in the beginning, it's really decoupling different clients. With why are using so many people Apache Kafka for a microservice architecture? Because it is also a storage system in the middle. It decouples the producers from the consumers. It handles the back pressure. It allows that consumers are down. It doesn't matter, the producers can produce. The consumers, when they are back online, then they can consume again. And they can consume at their speed and as often as they want. One other reason why this works is because Kafka is pull-based. So it does not push everything like a message queue to the consumers. So it's no problem if the consumer is down. Or if it's you start a new, completely new consumer, like a new application, then you can simply start from an earlier time, uh, point in time to consume the events from there. And the last most important point, or at least one important point is that it is no vendor login. So even if you work with a vendor like Confluent, and we also build a lot of nice additional components around Apache Kafka, the core infrastructure is Apache Kafka and it's under Apache license. So even if you start with a vendor and maybe decide later you don't want to pay any other subscription fees, you can move away from the vendor easily without doing a big migration project. 
So if you think about your existing MQ installations or ESPs, you cannot easily migrate away from that because you need another license, another product and do big migrations. For Kafka, the core foundation is Apache license. So you can stop paying a vendor and still running your infrastructure as you run it today because the core is all Apache Kafka. And here is one other point I really want to point out on an explicit slide. What's the difference of Kafka against traditional middleware? It really uses the principle of eat your own dog food. This means that you see on the left side different components, right? You see the MQ system, the ESB, the storage, the streaming engine. These are typically different products with different storage, different IDEs, different toolings, different operations modes, and so on. On the right side, you see Kafka. So Kafka really leverages the core of it for everything. This means um, the core is the messaging layer and the storage layer. And it's also the caching layer with that. Kafka uses the page cache of the memory and of the system to do very fast processing if you want. But also um, it's the core foundation for all the integration stuff. So like for Kafka Connect, for stream processing, for request response. It always uses Kafka as central layer for scalability, for high availability, and for zero downtime. So this means that no one of the applications needs to have its own database or storage layer. You can add uh, storage layers, of course, like another database or something else like Elasticsearch or Hadoop. But if you build applications or integration layers with um, integration connectors, all of that is managed with Kafka under the hood. It all uses Kafka topics for being highly available. Even if the connector is down or the REST proxy is down or another Java application is down, you can scale that up and down easily. And if it fails, it uses Kafka under the hood for guaranteeing zero data loss and 24 seven uptime. That's very different from the zoo of technologies you need for traditional middleware. So this is also where um, these kind of technologies compete with each other, of course. But what's even more important, so this is not the only enemy in this picture. There's many more enemies because, as I said before, um, MQ typically uses then a different technology or product than the integration layer. And again, a different product or framework than the streaming engine. And maybe then you have another storage layer like HDFS or maybe some object store in the cloud. So all of these are independent components and you need to integrate them with each other. And this really for many integration layers, which are 24 seven uptime requirement at SLA. Um, how, if you want to do that with end to end integration and support, and that's really hard to do compared to Kafka, where everything is eating their own dog food of Kafka topics for high availability under the hood. So that's a huge difference between these technologies. So this is really um, what Kafka is under the hood. If you compare that to the zoo of technologies you need with ESB, MQ, ETL, and so on, um, these are all in orange, so in all in one color, because all of these tools use Kafka topics under the hood. The operations team has to manage one specific infrastructure, or in, if you run the cloud as a service, then you don't even have to run it, but you still have to integrate with that from your other systems. And it's still one single integration infrastructure in the middle instead of using many in the middle. That's a huge difference. And as I've shown you before, that can be used for many different use cases. It's not just for one single use case if you use one Kafka cluster. So it's important to understand that not just the server side, the integration layer is scalable and highly reliable. It's also true for the clients because the clients also leverage the Kafka concepts under the hood, like partitions, like replication, like Kafka topics and all these kinds of things. So you can scale Kafka applications the same way very easily. Up, down, dynamically. Um, in a case of failure, it automatically restarts a new instance, for example, if you want with Kubernetes or whatever. That's totally flexible. You can use the technology you want under the hood. You can run it in the cloud, on-prem, with containers, bare metal, VMs, and scale it like you want with a tool, with a script, or manually. And it doesn't matter if it's a Java app, if it's a Python app, or if it's maybe an integration layer like using Kafka Connect. So all of them have the same concepts. They use Kafka under the hood. Eat your own dog food is again the most important thing here. Here is one example of showing that in this case, we're using a stream processing application with Kafka Streams or KSQL. And if you want to understand the fault tolerance here, so on the left side, you see um, three instances of this one client application. 
So it's one client application, but it also scales to many instances, in this case three. And let's assume that one of these instances is down, so you only have two for a time, some time in the middle. And then um, this is all handled by Kafka under the hood. And then also if the third instance is up again, this kind of rebalancing and all the high availability and zero data loss, that's all handled by Kafka under the hood for you. Again, one single infrastructure, it even handles the failover of the client side, whatever the client is like here a Kafka Streams or KSQL application, or maybe a Kafka Connect integration or a Java or Python client. And the same is true for flexibility and elasticity. So you can also dynamically add new instances. Let's assume you have Docker containers and Kubernetes. And then if you're a retailer, if you're in Christmas business, maybe in December, instead of using three instances, you can start five instances. And then after Christmas, you go back to two instances because nobody orders something after Christmas or something like this. So this is also handled by Kafka for you under the hood. And you don't have to think about how do I get this um, to the five instances now instead of the two or how do I do the failover? How do I do the scalability? That's handled by Kafka for you. And one, was one last note about the comparison now between Kafka and traditional middleware. And, and this is a great anti-pattern from Sortworks and Martin Fowler and his team. So they explained already two years ago that it's very bad idea to recreate the ESB anti-patterns with Kafka. So Kafka is a loosely coupled infrastructure and system. You can build agile microservices. With the ESB or any other integration middleware, you typically centralize the integration layer. That means all the integration which are implemented are built by the, by the integration team with the integration tools like the ESP tool, the ETL tool and so on. So the business teams or the, the decoupled integrations teams cannot do it on their own and scale it on their own and version and manage on their own. This is typically a bad, bad idea. So in case of Kafka, often the business teams or integration teams themselves handle their own integration. So it's not all by the one single integration team. You can do it that way if you want, if it makes sense. But in many cases, we see it really more decoupled with Kafka. And that's therefore often an anti-pattern you should not do. So now I talked a lot of time about how traditional middleware and Kafka or even streaming platform are enemies. Let's now think about, well, they are all fr also friends, right? And yes, absolutely. Um, the first reason why they are friends is that you can integrate them very well. So there is plenty of options to integrate Kafka with any existing traditional middleware. There are things like Kafka Connect connectors for the normal uh, messaging systems like JMS standard or specific connectors, for example, for IBM MQ or RabbitMQ. There is also more specific tooling like a Kafka native JMS implementation where you can replace your own existing JMS implementation with that one so that you simply send data to Kafka instead of to an IBM MQ, for example. And also almost every ESB or ETL tool of any vendor or open source framework has a Kafka connector in the meantime. That's typically also a little bit of market pressure, of course, because everybody uses Kafka in the meantime. And so these vendors also offer the integration from their tooling to that. And also, of course, you can use coding from any language or maybe HTTP to integrate between Kafka and middleware. There's a lot of options and therefore they are definitely friends and you can combine them very well. So using an even streaming platform does not mean that you have to throw away all your existing implementations and products, which is not possible anyway, of course, in big uh, environments and companies. So a little bit more detail, why are they friends? I mean, also to be honest here, Kafka is not the all-rounder for every single problem, of course, right? So if you, for example, just need to integrate with legacy components like COBOL or Edifact or maybe an ERP system, then typically the existing traditional middleware does this very well. They do it for 20 or 10 years and they have great connectors. And typically in your company, this is already running and implemented. So why do you want to re-implement that again with Kafka and write new code? That's probably a, a two-year project on its own. So it's much easier to use the legacy middleware to integrate with these systems and use them to connect them to Kafka. As we just heard, you can easily integrate traditional middleware with Kafka. And if you just want to implement a small point-to-point -point message in messaging infrastructure, then maybe also Kafka is too heavyweight for that, right? 
I mean, here you also can think more long term if you need more consumers and all the advantages of Kafka, like decoupling and all and so on. But sometimes a messaging system is fine for you. Also, Kafka is not built for low uh, low latency trading, for example. So if you have some requirements like microsecond messaging, then Kafka is not good enough for you. Kafka is for um, millisecond processing like let's say if 10 milliseconds is good for you end to end then you can sometimes or ha typically handle that with Kafka um, so it's more like use cases between 10 and 50 or 100 milliseconds end to end it's not for microsecond trading for example or maybe you want to use API management only for REST services then that's also not Kafka you can however combine them if you want a REST proxy together with API management and Kafka or maybe you want to do real batch processing right you, you can do batch processing with Kafka. So typically with Kafka, if you want to process a million messages, you don't send them one by one, but also in batches. And you can flexibly uh, configure your clients like you want to do that. But if you want to real batch processing, let's say MapReduce for um, analyzing terabytes of data to do reports, or if you want to batch processing with a tool like Informatica, like that's the tool for it, right? Um, that's great tools for that. And however, even a tool like Informatica has Kafka connectors in the meantime. So you can combine them very well. They are friends. And also, I mentioned that before, sometimes it's really also about um, graphical coding and so doing complex mappings. And that's typically also a thing where traditional middleware shines because they are available on the market as long as your legacy products for 10, 20 years. And if you have ever tried to integrate and do complex mappings with Edifact, SAP, BAPI, IDOC, COBOL, or something like SOAP Web Services with the WS Star, right? WS Security and all this stuff. Um, then probably you want to use a graphical tooling for that and probably already also have that implemented already. Um, for these kind of things, traditional middleware is often the right tool. So Kafka, you can integrate that if you want to do with something like XML and SOAP. Um, it's okay, but it's not a perfect world. So um, it really choose the right integration technology for your problem and think about how to scale and, and integrate and couple them together. So now I talked about um, Kafka and traditional middleware. They are enemies on one side and they are also friends on the other side. So in the end, I think, we can conclude that they are free enemies. Let's think about that a little bit more. Even if you plan and design your new architectures around Kafka, because it's more scalable, more re reliable and up 24 seven with rolling upgrades and so on, that totally makes sense for new architectures. But still, um, it's not so that you can do a big bang migration. There is no button for you to replace all your existing traditional middleware. And that will typically not work. Most of this middleware is running 24 seven and it's really for critical business cases. So Big Bang does not work, right? So therefore they're free enemies, use them together instead of just planning a five year replacement project. And on the other side, some technologies will never die, unfortunately, right? So something like mainframes, we will see that in any bank or insurance company for the next probably 10, 20 years or even longer. So it's okay to use your traditional middleware to integrate with that because the integration typically runs already. And then you integrate this traditional middleware with Kafka. That's very easy to do. And in this way, you can integrate the legacy with the new world. On the other side, um, some people still want to do a lot of RPC and request response. And, and that's totally fine um, because people know it for the last 10, 20 years and they don't want to change quickly or in, because even driven applications are dif built differently. It's new concepts, new paradigms, and it's hard to do if you don't understand it. So sometimes um, request response is still fine. However, you have to be aware that often it doesn't scale well and it's uh, synchronous communication with coupled systems to each other. So it's much, much better and recommended to really embrace the data that lives and flows between the services. So prefer the event-based way and you can integrate that. Use event-based infrastructures around Kafka and build your service around that. It has a lot of uh, advantages compared to request response. However, um, as this is not always possible for all projects or for all use cases, of course you can again combine them. You can build your infrastructure around Kafka in an event-based way. And where it's possible, you use events to communicate with applications. On the other side, sometimes you might use um, request response calls. 
either via traditional middleware like an ESP like you see in the left side or maybe like you see in the right side via a REST proxy. So even with native Kafka components you can do request response via HTTP to Kafka in both directions producing and consuming data. And also if you really need request response with Kafka you can implement that. So if you know the book about enterprise integration patterns, um, in best case, it's still asynchronous and you use messaging for doing request response because then it's decoupled and it's scalable and flexible. Even if you want to do request response with a correlation ID. Though there are patterns around that and you can also implement this with Kafka. So you don't need REST or SOAP web services or traditional middleware to do a request response. It's possible. And I've seen many customers which implemented this. However, you always have to understand the trade-offs. It's not the best thing to do that with Kafka for several reasons regarding scalability and so on. But it's possible and um, depending on your use case, it might, it might make sense. Just be sure to understand the trade-offs and then make the right decisions what to do. And also very important, um, as I said, you can combine streaming and event-based together with request response. And that can even be done natively with Kafka applications. So Kafka Streams, the stream processing engine on top of Kafka, allows to do interactive queries on top of the streaming data. So that means with interactive queries, you can query a stream. That might sound a little bit strange in the beginning because stream is continuously flowing data. But with interactive queries, you can do a request and get a response. For example, every 10 seconds to integrate with other batch systems. Or maybe from a mobile app, where you do an interactive query whenever a user clicks on a button on the mobile app. And then you do an interactive query, which requests the current state of the streaming application. This is also possible. And so it's very easy to combine streaming applications with request response and RPC style. And this can be done um, with uh, HTTP and REST, for example. We have an example for that. But you can do that with any RPC technology, like gRPC or SOAP, or whatever you want to use as wrapper for interactive queries. So with that, let's now think a little bit more about this, the streaming maturity where you are right now. On the left side, you see the pre-streaming error. And um, depending on where you are in your journey, um, you probably go more and more forward towards a streaming architecture. And as I said many times now in this session, it's totally okay to combine streaming and non-streaming. Um, typically we see the way that first it starts with developer interest, downloading Apache Kafka, then building a first pilot, maybe use some advanced tools for end-to-end -end monitoring or operations help. And then really you build your mission critical systems around that. And then you build more and more global streaming where more and more of your applications leverage the event-based architecture. But still you often combine it with legacy, with request response and other paradigms. That's totally fine. And depending on where you are, you can think about how to go on. We see customers in all these phases and we can support them everywhere. And also with the combination of traditional middleware and modern streaming applications and infrastructures. So how do you integrate the old and the new world, traditional middleware and streaming platforms? I want to give you three examples here of what we see at our customers. So the first example is mainframe offloading to Kafka. It could also be any other legacy um, application instead of a mainframe, but this is the one where you can save the most money. So this is a good example. What many customers do, they leverage Kafka in the middle for offloading the data and then they consume the data from Kafka. So this means that you still write data to the mainframe directly because it's really much harder to replace the, the, the write operations with the transactions in mainframes. But um, offloading the, the reads from the mainframe to Kafka can already save millions of dollars in many banks because you pay also for every read to the mainframe. And with this, you use Kafka in the middle to use it more or less as a caching layer so that you store the data as long as you want in Kafka. And then you can build new applications around that or even existing applications which read from the mainframe today can, can then consume the data from Kafka. And the great news with Kafka always is you can migrate back if it's not working well. So you do not have to do a big bang or uh, do some changes to the existing mainframe or other legacy applications. 
you just add another layer with Kafka and then you do A-B testing with a first process and then you let the new website consume from the Kafka instead of from the mainframe. And if it doesn't work, you can undo it easily. Just go back and consume from the mainframe directly again. So it's pretty easy and straightforward to try this out with some first processes. This is the first example. Another example regarding um, traditional middleware and Kafka is that what we see a lot is that, Kafka's, uh, that, that customers have existing messaging solutions already in place. And um, sometimes they're fine with it. Um, sometimes it doesn't scale work well anymore. So I've seen customers which used open source messaging tools and after three months they already found out it doesn't scale well for the, for the throughput and message size. And so they decided to migrate to Kafka quickly. That's the one option. Another use case is where simply um, messaging queues are too expensive because you have hundreds of brokers and pay a lot of money for them. And therefore they want to migrate to Kafka for, for um, cost reasons. There are different reasons for that. But what uh, many customers then do is instead of uh, using just a legacy MQ communication with the application, which you see here in blue, they add the Kafka layer. And then step by step, they connect the Kafka layer to the messaging solution. So as I said before, there's many different connect options, how you integrate Kafka with MQ or other messaging layers. And then later you can do the direct communication with Kafka as you see here in purple. And then you can replace the messaging system with that step by step, broker by broker. That's another option how you can use Kafka together with traditional middleware, either just for integration use cases or maybe really for replacement in the, in the end stadium. And then um, the third option is, of course, you can use Kafka to build new projects and applications. And this can also be together with existing integrations and applications. So in this way, you can integrate legacy with the new world in a decoupled environment and infrastructure because Kafka, as we learned in this session, decouples the different systems. The new applications, like in this case, the Kafka microservices or the external solutions like Spark or Elasticsearch, don't know about the sources which produce data. They are loosely coupled from each other. They pull the data like they want, some in real time, some in batch. It doesn't matter if the source is mainframe systems, ERP systems or sensors. You can easily combine all of this and integrate your legacy together with the traditional middleware or without it and integrate it also with the new applications on the other side. So with that as conclusion, use the right tool for the job and combine them where it makes sense. Kafka and traditional middleware are definitely friends and enemies at the same time. So they are free enemies. Make the right choice for the right project. And with that, just as a last thought, I talked a lot about even streaming platform today and how you can leverage Kafka. And this is really just the beginning of an event streaming platform. So our vision of Confluent, and that's really a vision which comes true this year and not just in, in a few years or so, is that Kafka gets even more global with things like disaster recovery over different regions or clouds and with geo-awareness. So that you can read for not just from one location, but from different locations and spin up Kafka clusters over different regions. And also Kafka will get infinite. That has advantages like you can use a tiered storage where you do not have just local data in Kafka, but also remote data like in an object store. And with this, you can store data in Kafka as long as you want. And you don't have to think much about cost and scalability and so on. And Kafka will also get much more elastic. So you can easily do it in a cloud native way to scale up, scale down and add new brokers and add many more partitions and all these things. So this is that Kafka will get much more cloud native, no matter if you run it in the cloud or on prem in your data centers, no matter if you run it on bare metal or in containers or on Kubernetes or these kind of tools, or if you run it as a service, for example, hosted by Confluent with 24 seven SLAs for availability and latency and throughput. That's all up to you, but Kafka is already ready for scale and reliability. But as you see here, it will even get better during the year with us. And that's just the outlook. And that's also important to understand when you think about how is Kafka related to traditional middleware? Because um, many of these things um, cannot be done with traditional middleware, right? So this is in the end a little bit the outlook. 
And so I hope I gave you a good overview about the comparison between even streaming platforms and Kafka compared to traditional middleware like MQ systems, ESBs or ETL tools and also how you can combine them together. Please at the end give me some feedback if you like this, if you agree, disagree or if you have any more questions. Please come back to me via LinkedIn or Twitter or post to this YouTube video. And thanks a lot for watching.